I mean, really, really terrible. I'm not sure why I watched it, but I did. But seriously, if a person were to absolutely stand still, they would instantly begin to accelerate in the opposite direction as the spin of the Earth. Then at a tangent opposite to the path of the Earth around the Sun, and then at a tangent of the much greater and faster and steeper path of the Sun around the galaxy, and ultimately in the opposite direction of the galaxy itself, and within a few moments of standing still, any object would very quickly be compelled into the realm of nothing, or into the void known as infinite space, which also does not exist, with the Earth and galaxy traveling away from the observer at over a million miles an hour. I always wondered, would time stop? What would happen to that person standing still in the infinite void of space? Would thousands of monsters come behind time to eat up all the people who strayed from the galactic frame of reference? behind time to eat up all the people who strayed from the galactic frame of reference. The observer, simply by standing totally still, would accelerate away from the Earth and galaxy, never to run into another object again, unless he happened to pass through the quote-unquote asteroid belt, or perhaps some, of the, some newer element of the universe trailing behind us, many light years behind us, traveling much more slowly since it departed from the non-existing Big Bang a few microseconds after we did during the initial instant after and our initial path from the central explosion in the center of the universe about 14 or so billion years ago. I'm sure there's a scientist around here somewhere who can corroborate the Big Bang. Could it be Degrassi? Scopes. Probe exotic states of matter with our particle accelerators and come to terms with how the universe began, how it evolved, and how it will end. And so, let's explore the evidence for the Big Bang. Now, all this talk about theory. Very early in the 20th century, we get to Einstein's theory of relativity. In the 1920s, we have quantum theory. We have quantum chromodynamics. There are all these theories. We no longer use the term law. So in modern times when we say law, in modern times when we say theory, if it's a well-tested theory, had that been the same theory around back in the 1800s, they'd be calling it a law, as they'd be calling the Big Bang, the Big Bang Law. But I will remain humble in the presence of <laughs> theories yet to be put forth, recognizing that perhaps one day the Big Bang will be enclosed in a bigger picture, a, mo a deeper understanding of how the universe works. So let's also demand that if you come up with a new theory, it's got to agree with the evidence <laughs> and predict things that maybe you hadn't known before. Otherwise, it's just sort of a an explanation that comes after the fact, piecing piece, putting pieces together without giving you new insight into how the world works. For the Big Bang in particular, a variety of experimental pillars support its status <laughs> as the most successful theory ever. And I call them pillars because the thing is resting on these pillars. We don't expect any more than one in a hundred thousand hydrogen atoms to be deuterium. Deuterium is just a version of hydrogen that has an extra neutron in its nucleus. Ooh. We didn't just make this stuff up. Oh. It's an unprecedented marriage of astrophysics and particle physics. And a coherent picture has emerged by the application of those two disciplines. Ooh. And when you combine them, it tells us that the galaxy velocities are real. The galaxy distances are real. The expanding universe is real. Relativity is real. Quantum mechanics is real. The early universe was hot. 
and the Big Bang is law. <laughs> With that being said, I think it's more plausible to have the asshole Balky thing happen than the whole bit about flying off into space at a series of ever-increasing velocities and angles, tangents from the orbital bodies and perpetual curving and spinning motions which don't exist in reality, just like asshole Balky doesn't exist. Everyone knows that guy was awesome and lovable based on his performance on TV's Perfect Strangers. Ho, ho, ho. <laughs> Balky Claus is coming to town and what does he have? An apple for Larry Appleton. <laughs> I come up with them. <laughs> and for you, Susan, your favorite sugarless gum. Oh, thank you, Balky. Balky, this is very nice. What's the occasion? Is today uh, Meepo's Apple and Gum Day? <laughs> Ask me how I paid for these things. Balky, how did you pay for these things? I wrote checks. <laughs> they came today. Balky, you wrote a check for an apple and a pack of gum? Ah, of course not. Don't be ridiculous. <laughs> I want to go to this nice bug light. I, I know. Knowing the truth about Balky, uh, no, excuse me, knowing the truth about simply standing still is exactly what it seems. And by standing still, we are totally safe to stand still and not be compelled off at some tangent at a million miles an hour. To me, this is an extremely liberating and comforting fact to be familiar with. I think of many of our society's psychological problems stem from a false belief that we live on an enclosed system with no escape that is basically not unique in any respect and we must collect more toys than the next guy to win at this upside down and perverted game called life so many of us have become experts at especially you card-holding capitalists out there uh, I hope you find fulfillment in your religion of money where you worship a spell called cash and you worship your ability to accrue greater mounds of worthless fiat currency than the next bloke over our ever-expanding universe, which has also been debunked, has created a trend for all businesses to follow. Ever onward, ever upward, never ever outward for some reason. We humans tend to follow the examples laid forth to us by nature in our primal innocent state, yet we are forced to follow in the examples laid forth to us by manipulative men who want to control the way we think or pass their way of thinking along to everyone else for one reason or another and ultimately to control the type of people we ultimately become by setting our goals for us using manipulative hypnotic suggestion and subliminal programming it is these men who dictate what we should strive for and what we should purchase or what we should try to avoid by controlling the way we view certain topics such as ourselves as worthless or insignificant individuals akin to a planetary virus. These men would have us believe, much like the wonderful book 1984, written in the 40s, that our brothers and sisters in the other parts of the world or the other countries are our enemies because they differ with us on some minor illogical divisive topic constantly manipulating the masses via the mass media to the point to where 90 percent of the people don't even realize they're doing it and since a phase in their life when they were still developing our personalities i'm sort of digressing but this is all sort of connected i i promise but i'll give you a quick example of how a totally righteous grassroots movement of the people can and always will be co-opted or taken over by rich insiders with an agenda that needs to be slipped into the movement's canon. The example I'll give is women's liberation. Uh, in the 1960s era, which was ultimately a Rothschild co-opted movement which started out with noble purposes and ideals, with strong, intelligent, sensible women and ideals and principles of uh, intelligent, well-meaning women and ended up becoming a divisive Hegelian topic 
used to polarize the people on minor issues and create a perceived problem which the compromised figureheads or mouthpieces or puppets at the top of the quote movement could then dictate orders or solutions or directives talking points and ultimately steer the entire group of well-meaning fired up people down the chain of command towards a goal that is contrary to the fundamental or original ideals of the movement in the first place. Public spectacles for inflated attention such as bra burnings and an ultimate solution to the women's liberation movement which amounted to the destruction of the American family by doubling the available workforce W women could now apply for jobs, which flooded the job market with applicants, lowering the wages for all, not to mention women were henceforth forced to pay income taxes, something they didn't have to do before, a goal which the greedy elite of the time had been planning on for decades. Anyways, so they craftily used the momentum of the burgeoning grassroots women's lib movement into a tool of their own agenda which doubled the workforce, lowered the average wage, doubled the amount of tax quote revenue, and ultimately the worst tragedy of the entire thing, which was the dismemberment of the American family unit in general. Now I know that sounds like a lot, but now that the workforce is doubled, a worker is expendable, more so, so that means less job security, there are 10 people in line to fill the job, so the wages are stagnant and remain stagnant to this day. Um, if you look at inflation or you know how much our money's worth and how, how little it's worth compared to it was, say, in the 1960s, and if you look at the, the raise in the minimum wage or even in the average rate of income, it's totally disproportionate. Um, it's designed to make honest, hardworking people set up to fail and need to borrow money at interest. That's their entire scheme. But so anyway, uh, with 10 people in line to fill the job, the wages are stagnant and remain so to this day. Children are now raised by the federal system, which prints the money we all worship, because mom and dad are off working two to four jobs on average, you know, two each, one or two each, in order to simply survive when it used to be that a uh, single man could uh, raise a family of four on an average job and still have plenty of money left over for a vacation and an extra car. But in order for us to simply survive in a world that's gotten so far out of control, we're on the precipice of societal breakdown over the course of about 14 years since 9-11 as the catapult into the new world order according to the neoconservative plutocrats who had a project for a new American century who came into power with W and ensured a new Pearl Harbor went off without a hitch only months into their surprise presidency. But going back to women's lib, the family un unit was divided into separate isolated entities, all satellites of a central home, all doing their own little respective things, all striving towards a similar end goal, putting Federal Reserve notes into the economy, consuming learning the federal uh, schooling system, Operation Make Everyone Dumb as Fuck, word for word, consuming and creating new Federal Reserve notes by putting your money in the bank like a good American so that your money can lose its value because the bank can now loan out 10 times more than you just deposited, effectively creating a money out of thin air which further devalues the currency on the local level, just like the Federal Reserve Bank, which is as federal as High Times Magazine, just like the World Bank is doing on the world stage, and so eloquently put by Karen Hughes. If you are not familiar with Karen Hughes, you really need to listen to what she has to say. She is a whistleblower that was working as an attorney for the World Bank, discovered all sorts of corruption, blew the whistle on them, she brought it out. The World Bank is an international financial institution that's designated to help developing countries by providing loans on the name of, quote, reducing global poverty. However, the banking giant has been accused of actually increasing poverty by keeping the third world in perpetual debt and in servitude to the first world. But aside from its obvious critiques, there's also blatant criminal corruption taking place at the highest levels of the financial institution. One woman has risked everything to shed light on this truth. 
which is exposed information that reveals the extent of the collusion between financial groups.